Hello, I made a video a while ago called What Exactly Is IO Mixer where I gave a fairly broad overview of what the system is all about but I didn't go into detail on many of the features because there are so many features that that video would have become very long and instead all I did was put in a couple of slides like this for the inputs uh, that one for the outputs and I just breezed right past this pretty quickly but these slides don't really explain all that much and this wall of text approach probably doesn't really leave much of an impression on people so I thought I'd make another video now where I will set up each one of these features that we have and just give you a, a little look at them in action. Just to recap the way the system works is you configure it by setting up a bunch of these things that I'm calling nodes and you connect them together and change their properties to do what you want and that gives you a program of sorts but keep in mind you don't need to do any source code programming so everything I'm about to show you in this video is achieved just by clicking around over here to get some sort of a node into the system and then connecting them like that and setting their properties appropriately from time to time we also need to fiddle with the settings in this panel but I don't think I'm going to show you any of that setup process in this video it will take too long I'll just do that off camera and then I'll show you the result and of course I'll also show you the set of nodes that were required to achieve that and I'll just focus on the input and output nodes those are the ones that we saw in the slide earlier and an input or an output node that means there's some sort of hardware external to the system where we get information from or output information to um, but keep in mind in between those inputs and outputs there could be a whole bunch of other logic as well okay let's start with digital input and output because that's about the most basic thing we can do so have a digital input on pin 1 that's being pulled up. Pin 1 is this one here with the purple wire connected to it and it's not connected to anything at the other end at the moment but I want to connect that to ground to be like a switch that's why I wanted to have it pulled up and that's why it's uh, giving us a value of 1 at the moment. By the way this float here that doesn't mean that that <laughs> pin is floating it just means that the value type being produced by this node is a floating point number and that's being passed over to this node digital output on pin 27 that's this one with a regular LED and a current limiting resistor underneath the heat shrink there and the reason it's on at the moment is because the input node is passing a 1 to it so that's 1 is on but if I connect this other side here to ground we'll see that that LED goes off uh, so that's uh, about as simple as you can get if you wanted it the other way around so that when you connect this to, to ground the LED goes on you could use well there's very various ways you could do it but uh, putting an invert node in between those two is about the simplest way so if I upload that you'll see LED is on in that situation and when I disconnect this now the LED will go off so we just did, did it the opposite way around okay let's have a look at an analog input this is one case where you need to use some specific pins for that feature in this case it's these ones with the yellow pin headers on them let's have a little bit closer look there so those six pins with yellow, uh, the yellow is 3.3 volts, the red is 5 volts. And if you're going to put a potentiometer on here, you need to use the 3.3 volt ones. And these are the only ones that are set up to use an analog to digital converter anyway. So uh, we have six analog inputs, and on one of them I have put a potentiometer, and that is on pin 23 there. And over here on pin 1, I have a servo PWM output and they're just directly connected together so when I move the potentiometer we get the servo moving and that's about it although I guess we could uh, do that little trick that we did before with the invert node and reverse the direction so at the moment we're going the same way and we could just set them up to go the opposite way like this just for a little example so to make that servo move we were using a servo PWM output. Next I want to look at duty cycle PWM output. So the, these are both PWM outputs but they're slightly different. The duty cycle PWM output is basically on for a certain percentage of the cycle. Uh, and I'll show you this on <laughs> oscilloscope in a minute so that it'll be a little bit clearer what, what it is. But I have this uh, pin 39. We have four duty cycle PWM outputs available there and I'm using one of them with my LED again and my input is the uh, potentiometer and you can see that when it's at zero that LED is completely off and as I start to raise it the pin is on for a larger percentage of the time and the servo is moving with it just, just so you can see that they're 
both of these things are taking the same input. And if I bring it all the way up, it's the LED will be on 100% of the time. Uh, it doesn't show very well on the camera, but it gets a lot brighter when you do that. Like that. So let me just show you on the oscilloscope the difference in the type of pulses that are being output here. Okay, that's what those two pulses look like on the oscilloscope. The one at the top is servo PWM and the one at the bottom is duty cycle PWM. And they're both reading from the same input. So we have that analog input, that's my potentiometer. And I'll just zoom in so you can have a look at what the value of that is currently. It is about halfway, and as many of my viewers may know, the way that servo PWM pulses work, there's more of these pulses here, by the way, if I just zoom out a little bit. So the servo PWM pulses coming less frequently. Um, but the way this works is that when your input is at zero, you get a 1,000 microsecond long pulse. So there's 500 microseconds per division. And when it's at full, you get a 2,000 microsecond long pulse. So that pulse is going to vary from there to there. And I'll just put it back to halfway again. Now the duty cycle PWM varies from either being completely off or completely on or half half and half. So we're at the halfway point now. It's about half and half on. If I go to about quarter of the way, it's on a quarter of the time. And I can make it fully off there or fully on. Not sure what this little spike is there. I might have to check into that. But hopefully this explains the difference between these two pulses. So the one at the bottom is the one that was being given to the LED in the last little uh, clip of video to make it dimmer and brighter. Hope that clears up the difference between servo PWM and duty cycle PWM. Oh, and I should mention we can change the frequency of that too. So we're looking at a 1 kilohertz pulse at the moment, but that could just as easily be uh, any of these other things here. So 36 kilohertz. Let's try that. Of course, I'm going to have to zoom in my oscilloscope quite a bit to see that, and it's going to be a bit sort of jumpy, but the same, same thing applies here. It's just at a higher frequency. So this can sometimes be useful to give you a smoother pulse for certain applications. But anyway, that's how it works. And I just thought I'd show you that because I had a few questions about it. Okay, let's see what we can do with these RGB LEDs or addressable RGB LEDs. If we can just focus there. I have a strip of eight, and the first, third, fifth, and seventh of those are illuminated in a purpley kind of color. And on board, we also have three here in the corner, like that. And the outputs to these are the same, so this three here and the first three on the strip will be the same thing. To do this, we have something called RGB LED indices output, and it's called indices because here you set which specific indices of that strip you want to do. I want to have lit, lit. So I've got 1357, and the color we can set up with this thing called color. How about that? And we have a little input here we can change it to, say, green. Let's change it to green. That's green. Um, and we can also change the color components individually. So anyway, we see one of these like white circles on the input side, that means we can connect that to somewhere else. So if I connect that to here, now I can control it or control the red component with my analog input on pin 23, which I have from before. So, oops, let's go this way. So now, this is just the red component that I'm changing. So when I turn the red all the way down, it stays this little greeny blue color we had, and all the way up we get red. So this lets you change the color of those things um, smoothly in real time from other nodes. And you can also, while you're setting things up, it's very handy to use this tweak color node. So if I just connect this directly to there and open up this editing thingy, I can use the web interface to set that color in real time to get it exactly to the color that I need. We can also specify which LEDs to use as a range if we want to change that range during runtime. And to do that, we would use this RGB LED range output, which takes a color, of course. And then it takes the first and last indices of the range that we want to affect. And I've set that to 4 and 6, which is why we have LEDs 4 through 6 illuminated at the moment. But the important thing about this one is that this one has these white nubs, which we can connect to something else to have it dynamically changed during the running of the program. So I'll just connect that to my analog input, which I've multiplied by 8. So this node here is going to give us a value between 0 and 8. And if I upload that, 
we'll see just one of them illuminated and that's because I set the first and last to the same thing so we're just going to get one LED and now when I move my analog thingy back and forwards we'll get just one LED showing or if I move it all the way to zero we'll get nothing because this first LED is index one so we're <laughs> we're trying to light up zero which doesn't exist so that's why we get that anyway that's a LED range okay next we can use one of these rotary encoders which might at first glance look like a potentiometer but it's actually counting the steps there's distinct steps here when I move it it makes a clicking feeling maybe maybe you can even hear that and it's counting those steps and we can see how many it's counted in this uh, number there so let me just put that back to zero so this is where it started off and this particular encoder has 30 clicks or 30 steps per revolution so if I put this white mark horizontal and then I go around like this and when I get back to here we should see 30 and if I go back here to horizontal again we should see 0 where I started um, so this is quite good for counting distinct steps rather than smooth variations like the potentiometer does and I've connected that up so that I have an LED on here and I want a number between 1 and 8 inclusive for this um, LED strip so to get that I'm dividing my rotary encoder number by 8 this gives me a value between or from 0 to 7 and if I add 1 to that I'll get a number from 1 to 8 and I'm putting that into my RGB LED range as I was just before uh, except it's a little bit different because I can just keep going forever and ever past the end of the scale and it just wraps around and around and around um, yeah so that's a rotary encoder okay let's see what we can do with a display node I have a couple of display nodes set up there and each of those lets me put a line of text on this little screen with a value and a label and a little bit of formatting um, I'm going to use this screen for the demo but there are some other ones you can use that are supported so I'll just quickly give you a glance at those but I like using this one because it's larger and it's the text is easy to read and it's color and it's very cheap so I almost always use this one um, yes yeah, so basically we just have the milliseconds value this is the number of milliseconds that have elapsed since the program started so if I upload this again that's going to go to zero one well by the time we look at it, it's not going to be zero especially if it doesn't focus properly but you can see that's about six seconds and the steps there is this is coming from my um, rotary encoder so let me just get you in there a little bit while I turn the rotary encoder you can see that that works like that there we go that's how that works um, so on this particular screen you can get I think 20 lines which is quite nice um, and we can change the color of these lines too let me see if what we can do that uh, tweak color let's put the color of this on here and we'll change it to um, we're changing the bottom one there, the steps one, and we'll make it. Oh, these need to be bright as possible for this. So it's red, now it's blue, uh, whatever, you know. <laughs> you can see it, right? Anyway, so you can change that text uh, dynamically during the, during the running of the program, which is kind of nice. Oh, and you can set the um, background color as well, so let's do that instead. So there we go, you could have red background and green text like that. Just uh, whatever whatever takes your fancy. Now let's see how we can get values from an inertial measurement unit, or IMU for short. That's this thing here. We have one on board, and this is an MPU 6050. There's an accelerometer and gyroscope inside. And from that we can get pitch, roll, and of course the gyro um, rate values. And we do that by setting up an IMU node and we have to select what value we want so we can get the raw values like that or we can get the sensor fuse values like that and just to demonstrate that we have this uh, and if I tip it up that way well if it's flat on the bench we get about zero right if I tip it up this way to about 45 degrees oh that's not 45 there we go 45 degrees in roll and if I go this way I should get pitch about 45 degrees or so there and we can also have a second IMU externally if we so desire and we do that like this so that's this one oops turn these on and for this one we select the device to be external so we do that 
in this second pull down here where we have onboard and external. And if we just have a quick look at this, uh, one thing you need to do if you're going to actually set this up is you need to set this IMU to have a different I squared C address. Uh, oh, I should mention that we've, we're plugging into this four pin header which is for I squared C devices there. Uh, so you can have multiple devices on the I squared C bus of course, but they can't all have the same address. And the default address is the one that's being used by the onboard IMU in this case. So we need to um, change the I squared C address for the external one. That's what this little red piece of wire is doing. And if I put this one flat on the bench, we'll see we get about zero there. If I tip it this way, we get 48 or whatever. And then this way we get, let's see if we can get 45 for pitch there like that. And I should show you those all at the same time, of course. So you can see that while I'm while I'm moving the external one, the values for the onboard one are not being affected. So in this way, you can actually have two IMUs. That's pretty cool, isn't it? Okay, next up is another I squared C device. So once again, we're plugged into this four pin header there. And this time it is a barometer. This is the BME 280. You can also use BMP 280, but it has to be one of those two at the moment. And from that we can get four values as we see over here, temperature, humidity, pressure and altitude. The altitude is just very roughly calculated from the pressure using some formula that I found on the internet somewhere. So don't look at that as any great source of accuracy. Um, temperature at the moment is in degrees Celsius, but uh, we have some options over here where we can select the um, units. So if we wanted Fahrenheit we could change it like that. That's what it is in Fahrenheit. Uh, humidity is a percentage pressure that looks like bar but we can have it in pascals or something else as well and this can be in meters or feet or something um, we can also have two of these devices on the bus together in the same way that we were doing for the IMU just before we have to make sure that the I squared C address is different for each of them and the way that's done at least on this little breakout board is there's a couple of pins at the top I forget which one it is but there's one called SDO and there's one called CSB I think that is um, so I'm not sure which but one of those you would connect it either to ground or to 3 volts and then depending on whichever you've selected there you would match that up with this ground or VCC there and then uh, that would determine which of the two devices on the bus that this particular node is going to give you the value for um, so that's about it for barometer well, let me let me just put my finger on here and let's see if we can um, warm it up a little bit. So starting at 68.9 just to make sure it's actually working. There we go. Seems to be okay. And next up we have another I squared C device. This is a compass or a magnetometer and this one is the HMC 5883L, a rather long name for such a tiny little thing. We can actually have three of these on the bus together as long as they're not all the same type. So we can have that type and then we can have two other ones that I forget the name of but I'll put them down here and they can all run together and these will give us these values that we're looking at there raw X, raw Y and raw Z and those are the strengths of the magnetic field that it feels in each axis and if we look at those there we've got 20, minus 27, 370-ish and 230-ish but if I bring something made of metal close to the compass and twiddle around a bit you'll see them going berserk as they detect the influence of the magnetic field around them changing. So those three numbers we want to use those to calculate whether we're facing north or south or west or whatever but unfortunately it's not enough just to use those numbers at least if we want to get a good result. We also need to take some values from an IMU not necessarily the onboard one because let's say we're on separate pieces that IMU might be moving around when the compass is not moving they need to be stuck to the same thing and moving together like this um, and then you can use this uh, IMU to compensate for whatever the tilt is because we need to know how this is tilting relative to the earth or relative to gravity that's the whole reason we want to use the IMU so it's quite um, complicated to set up to be honest and I'm not going to go into it too much more in this video it's almost worth a video all by itself but we have a few things over here that we need to set up. Oh, we need to we need to have this whole calibration step too. So there's quite a bit to it. And we need to select which IMU we're going to use, the onboard or the external. And we also need to specify 
how that IMU is oriented relative to the compass with these X, Y, and Z options there. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty tricky thing to set up, to be honest, but thankfully it does work quite well when it's all set up. All right, let's see how we can use a load cell. This is a load cell there, but we don't talk to that directly. The IO mixer is going to connect to this piece, which is the load cell amplifier. This is an HX711 load cell amplifier. These are pretty cheap and easy to come by. And they have a clock and a data pin on there. And I said I wasn't going to show you how all this stuff is set up, but I think I will for this one because we can set it up and do all the calibration and, and everything in probably under a minute, uh, which I think is pretty good. So we'll start by adding one of these nodes to the scene. And I need to say which pins my clock and data are on. And as you'll see here, we can select uh, from basically all of the digital pins are available and we can have more than one load cell. So we could have it, quite a lot of them if we wanted to. Anyway, I'll upload that and turn this live value on so we can see the raw value that's coming from this load cell. I'll just shift that over a bit. And when I push down on here, you'll see that number changing a little bit. But that number is not very useful to us. We want something that's a bit more meaningful. So we can do that by calibrating with a known weight, in this case a 100 gram load. And I need to say what the load is for the calibration here. And then we need to take two readings that are 100 grams, in this case, apart. Uh, and I do that by clicking on this calibrate button. And that's going to constantly read in the current value and put it in this little text input there and I think it's doing a little bit of averaging as well so the longer we wait the better here but I don't want to waste your time too much so I'm just going to stop it there and then we put the weight on and then we calibrate with this other one and I'll just give it a few seconds there that's probably enough then we turn that off and then we upload to take take those new values into account and then we should see a value of about 100 here that's not too bad when I take this off we should see about zero that's also not too bad um, so I've got a couple of things here I can weigh 18650 should be about f are these 50 grams or 45 or something like that that number's flickering around a little bit too quick um, we could put a moving average node on the other side on the output of this to, to slow that down a bit. Um, but I'll, I'll, I mean, you can see how it works, right? And I have this uh, socket thingy here, which is, I think that is about 20 grams. Yep. Anyway, <laughs> you get the idea. That's um, how a load cell works. Now, for those of you who were wondering when we're going to do some radio control stuff, here it comes. The first thing we're going to look at is a PPM output. So that means that the IO mixer is outputting a PPM signal on these little wires here and they are going into this radio module. This is the kind of module that you would plug into the back of your radio. I don't actually have a radio that can accept a module like this so I just bought this one to do testing for IO mixer. It's the cheapest one I could find and it's a FlySky system but it could be any other kind of system as well and usually the way these work is they have a little plug or a set of pins there that can um, plug into the back of your radio and they most of the time I think they take a PPM signal so that's what I've got here whoops scroll up a bit and you'll need to f figure out which of the pins are which on your module so that's what I've done here and it's all connected and ready to go and on the receiver side I just have a FlySky receiver uh, this is just a, a BEC to power the receiver and a servo to show us something happening and the input I'm just going to use this tweak number node to control it but this could be any of the other inputs that we've looked at so far so I'm just going to slide slide this up and down and of course there's no there's no physical connection here this is uh, happening over the over the radio network of course network not a network radio connection that's what I mean to say so that's how you could output all of the stuff that you've built in your configuration can be sent over a um, off-the-shelf radio control system like this. Okay, next we're going to try PPM input. So this means that the I/O mixer is going to be on the receiving side of the signal. So I've connected the receiver to one of the pins on the I/O mixer over there, and the sending side, <coughs> the transmitter, is going to be my radio control thingy here. And I've just set up something very simple so that we have one PPM channel, channel three in this case, which is the throttle on my radio and that's going to go to LED number one and you'll notice that I didn't give it a, a proper color by using a color node 
so all this is going to do is just give us either white or nothing. I mean, it's a scaling of white, so I'll show you what I mean. So we, when we use the throttle here, LED 1 is just going to be scaled between off or fully on with all white, like that. And just to show you that this is a um, multi-channel protocol, so we can have up to eight channels again here. They're all going over the, the one wire connection, though. Uh, so I've got a couple more of these nodes and LEDs. So the second LED we can control with this two-position switch. So halfway it's going to be about half power. And then all the way down is going to be fully on. That's the second LED. A little bit hard to see there maybe. And then the third LED is just fully on or fully off on this switch. So they are different LEDs there, but maybe a little bit hard to see. Anyway, that's... Um, PPM input. Okay, the next thing I want to look at is serial RC input, and there's quite a few protocols out there, but at the moment we just have IBUS and SBUS supported. So I've moved my plug on the receiver from the PPM plug over to where the IBUS and the SBUS, or the you know serial RC output comes from. And I'm going to use my radio again. And on your radio, you'll need to set it up so that you are outputting either IBUS or SBUS, whichever one you want. Um, so let's look at IBUS first, and to do that we have a serial RC input node, and we say which channel we want to read from. Um, there's a little red marker here which is saying that there's a bit of a problem, and it says we need to set the UART role in the features settings, and I can click on this so that this tab or this panel on the left will jump to where I need to look at. And it turns out that there's three UARTs, so the serial RC input is on a, on a UART connection, and I have my plug connected to pin 1, so I'm going to use UART 1, which is pin 1 is RX. And I can cho choose various roles for that, and we'll look at some other ones um, in a minute, like GPS. But for now, I'm just going to select IBUS, and my little error marker goes away. And then if I upload this, we have basically the same behavior as before. Uh, that switch does that. That switch does that, and then my throttle throttle stick will do a gradual uh, brightening on that first LED. Uh, so it's, that's about it, I guess. Um, although, of course, with iBus we can have up to 14 channels. This particular radio that I'm using here, the FlySky one, can only do 10 channels. But um, overall, it's better than PPM, of course. And so the next thing I want to look at is SBus. It's basically the same, so I'll leave most of that connected or I'd like to but unfortunately with SBUS you need to use an inverter one of these little little thingies there it's a tiny little transistor there and we've got to put this in the middle of there so let's change first on here I'll change to where oh, whoops okay so I'm going to be SBUS and you'll notice that all of a sudden we, we've got nothing because we have a different protocol but if I Unplug this and plug this one in here. So the connections are all the same other than that there's this inverter in the middle. And now we want to set that UART port to be SBUS and upload. And I have a feeling I'm forgetting something, but let's see. Oh no, that's right. Okay, so that's all I needed to do. Um, but you'll notice there's a little bit of a difference here. When I put this switch to the middle, we get nothing. All the way down we get a light that's not as bright as we had before. And on my throttle, even though I raise this a little bit, we get nothing until about halfway. And then it starts coming on. And that's because the range of values that are sent by the S bus are different. So when you're looking at I bus, you get a value between 1000 and 2000. So that's what this calibration setting is. Uh, these are the minimum and maximum values that we're expecting. But SBUS sends values from about 200 to 1800. So this might be a good time to look at what this calibrated thing is. So I change that. Oops, let's go back to my properties. So we can le look at either the calibrated value, which is going to give us a value between 0 and 1, or we can look at the raw value. So if I just upload that, we'll see that it says 240. This is the throttle. 240 at the bottom and about 1800 or a little bit under 1800 at the top. If I push it hard, I can get it to 1800 like that. So this is the calibration range that we should be using for SBUS. 
and we can type that in but that's a bit of a nuisance so what we can do instead is we can delete these two inputs like that so that they're empty and then I can click this calibrate checkbox on those two there and then I just move the stick to the bottom and the top of the range and you can see those min and max values being filled in automatically for me like that so 240 1807 and then uncheck the calibrate this is important because otherwise it'll mess it up and then set it back to calibrated and then upload so now we should get a value from zero and when I move it just a little bit we get some brightness showing and when I get all the way to the top we get full value of one or well, if I push it a little bit we get one like that so that's how those uh, calibrate checkboxes and things work and you might have noticed those earlier when we were looking at analog inputs and stuff so there's quite a few things where you can do this sort of a calibration if you don't know the exact values you can use this live value to have it filled in for you automatically oh and in case it wasn't clear you can actually have three different receivers as serial RC inputs at the same time if I go back to this features panel um, so for this example I was just using UART 1 and I set that to be iBus or SBus or whatever but we have two other UARTs so I could set this one to be iBus and this one to be SBus or whatever you want and then you're probably wondering how does each node know which receiver it should be listening to if we look at the properties for that node we'll see we have an option for port here if there's nothing selected um, it will just take the first available one that matches the type that it should be listening for but we could also say explicitly that this node should be listening to the receiver that's connected to UART 2 like so now if the radio system that you're using does not have any serial RC output capability on the receiver you're going to be stuck using this a uh, little bit more old-fashioned system called servo PWM and I have such a system here this is the Dumbo RC receiver and it's a six channel output with only servo PWM output so I'm having to use a wire for each channel and the transmitter for that is this uh, pistol grip radio for cars and over here I have on pin 20 oops, sorry on pin 27 I have a servo connected and you can probably see what's going to happen here this is the uh, pin 9 is where I have connected the steering so you can see that servo going there in the background hopefully a little bit unfocused but that's how it works um, and I don't have these other ones connected to anything but just have a quick look at the values on the screen there you can see the throttle will range from about 1 to about zero and then on pin 11 I have this one connected which is a just a two position toggle switch <clears throat> so it's going to go from zero to one um, yeah so that's how servo PWM works so you can use that as well alright so using an off-the-shelf radio system that's all very well but what if you wanted to make your own custom radio system and for that we can use these little NRF 24 radio modules I have one on there and one on there so this is going to be my transmitter just powering this from USB on the computer and has a potentiometer attached and this is my receiver and powering that from this battery and it has a servo attached so this is kind of similar to one of the very early examples we saw in this video except that there's a wireless connection between them and I've seen a lot of people using these NRF24 modules and it seems to be a bit of a struggle sometimes they have difficulties getting it all set up uh, with Arduino usually they're doing it so uh, with this system with the IO mixer I wanted to try and make this as simple as possible and the way it works is you've probably already had a little look there but you can see an analog input goes into an NRF24 output so this is a transmitter here we're outputting and then over here we have an NRF24 input for the receiver and that goes into the servo and there's a little bit of extra setup we need to do in this uh, features panel we need to say that this one is a transmitter and this one is a receiver and then there's the structure of the packet that gets sent needs to be set as well this B signifies a byte so I'm just sending a single byte and we have to make sure that that matches exactly on this side as well um, I could send in theory up to 32 bytes so I could have 32 channels if you like um, the resolution is 256 steps so well, let me just here we go <laughs> just demonstrate that it works so that's how it works so what I'm doing here is I'm taking this um, 0 to so that's it 0 or 1 or almost 1 and that's being scaled into a value between 0 and 255 to fit into one byte 
So we're losing some resolution there by, by doing that, but it gives us 32 channels. The other thing you can do in here is you can put an F. Um, so you can put like F and B like this, and you can arrange the format of the packet just like this to whatever you want. So one byte, uh, the first member is a byte, then we have a float, then we have a byte. And as long as that matches up the same on this side, you can just copy and paste that text into the other side to make sure it matches. Then um, everything should be working all right. And the point of using a float is that you can get a perfectly bit-for-bit -bit, um, rep reproduction of that value on the other side, which can be important if you want to send something like a lat-long position for, for example, you're making a follow me thing like I've done a couple of times in the past. You need that floating point lat-long number to be perfectly the same when it arrives on the other side. So for that you can use uh, a float. But notice that a float uses uh, four bytes, so in total we're using six bytes. So the main thing is you need you need to keep this to within 32 bytes. Anyway, um, so that's how that works. Oh, and it doesn't need to be two IO mixes. So I'm using two here because I just have them sitting here. But um, the one side could be just a regular Arduino running the NRF NRF24 as well. And I have some source code to do that. And again, as long as the packet structure matches up, then you know this one could be the Arduino or the transmitter could be the Arduino, whichever you like and that will work perfectly fine as well. Okay, let's see what kind of information we can get from a GPS. So I have a little GPS module here, and this is a Baixian BN220, one of my favorites. Nice and small and cheap. And this is connected through this JST plug here. There's actually, the two pins here, pins 26 and 27, are the same as what's on this plug. So if it's more convenient, you could use regular um, plug connections like that for maybe if you don't don't have one of these kind of plugs. And the type of GPS that you can use needs to support the UBX protocol. So I'll put a little list up here of the GPS modules that I've tried with this that I, I know to work. Uh, in the future we might try also the NMEA protocol, but I'm not, not making any promises just yet. Uh, so to get some information out of this, we need to add a node, GPS node, and then we select the field that we want to look at. Uh, there's quite a few fields we've got here, but... Um, yeah, I'll just let you quickly look at that, I suppose. And update rate just tells us how many packets per second we're receiving from the module. And you can see each time that light flashes, it's sending a packet to us. Uh, you wouldn't really use that during the, the running of your program much, but it's kind of handy to look at as you're setting things up. And we expect to see eight if everything's working all right. Second is the time, current time. It's actually not accurate at the moment because I'm inside, so I don't have any... Um, actual satellite reception probably but normally this would be the GMT time and this is the seconds part of that so you can see it's counting up once per second and when it gets to 59 it will go back to zero and I have a couple of other things here just for no particular reason but um, oh, I, was, yeah, I guess I was going to mention that for some of the fields they have options for the units that you might want to uh, use with them so you could make it kilometers per hour or meters per second miles per hour whatever suits you and that's how that's set up there's another node type here called geocalc which is also uh, it also uses the data coming from the gps and what this does is, is it will output the distance from the current location to some other location that you would put in here and it can also be the bearing too so if i change the type of the output now we've got the bearing so this is going to be a compass bearing from zero to 360 degrees where uh, east is 90 degrees and so on and you can use that to do some cool stuff as well now this connection that we're using here is a UART connection so as with the other things that we're using UART we need to um, set in the features we have to choose where is it here so I've chosen GPS as the role for UART 3 which is that plug there and we could have two other GPS's in here as well so I could say GPS GPS like this and we have three GPS's and compare them and I actually did that in the video uh, last year didn't I um, there's a couple of other things that you might find very useful because when you buy one of these modules typically it's not going to be outputting the correct messages for the IO mixer to use but we can get the IO mixer to set it up to the correct um, situation by selecting do init yes and that's a bit slow so you don't want to do that every time probably and you can save it or either not save it. You might not want to save it if you're just temporarily using this module and maybe you want to use it for something else later and you don't actually want to change the configuration. You can leave the save config to no. Uh, this init delay here is for if you're using a GPS module which is a little bit slow to power up 
and it's maybe not going to be ready and waiting for the messages, the configuration messages. messages. And so we can just give it a little bit of time to wake up, say like 500 milliseconds, 1000 milliseconds and so on. Anyway, that's, um, that's how we get information from a GPS. Okay, now let's have a look at controlling some serial bus servos. And this is where instead of having one connection to each servo, all of the servos are in a big long string all in a line together. And they have an address or an ID number. So you say that this servo should move to this position and this servo should move to that position. And you do that by giving them or issuing commands to their ID number. And the protocol that I'm using here is called Luan Sol Bus Servo Communication Protocol. And it can, in theory, have up to 253 servos on the bus. Although in practice, I think it would be a little bit awkward to provide power for that many servos. I suppose you could do it, but uh, I don't feel like I don't think I'll be doing it anytime soon. But anyway, the way it works is um, we need this thing called a uh, bus linker, and this takes a UART connection or it connects to the I/O mixer via a UART uh, connection there. So that's what this this wiring is, and I'm powering this. Um, these servos can take up to 14 volts and I have a this is a 3S battery so it's about 11 volts at the moment and this is powering the bus linker thingy which powers all the servos and it also rather conveniently has a 5 volt regulator on it which I'm using to power the uh, IO mixer with the 5 volts and to make some something happen I'm using a um, iBus as it happens oops that was a little bit aggressive Ooh, okay hang on uh, let's see what that is looks like in the IO mixer configuration. So I have uh, just three serial RC inputs from my iBus, that's one, two, three, and three servos. And you'll notice that the servos each have an ID. So on the, uh, this is roll. <laughs> so just to, I'm just using this to control it. So roll, that must be the servo of ID one. Pitch is servo ID two. And then on the throttle, I have that one there. And there's various brands of servo that you can get to work with this stuff. I uh, just have a couple here. This is a LX224HV. And these other two here are a bit cheaper. LX16A. These seem to be quite popular with most people because they're fairly capable, but they are still fairly cheap. So that's how servo bus servos work. Sorry, serial bus servos. That's how those work. Oh, and I should also mention that you can use the IO mixer to assign IDs to these servos because when you buy these, they initially come out of the box set to, I think it's ID 254, which is a special ID which will respond to any message even if it's not matching their ID. And obviously that might not be what you want and you want to set them to say that this servo is ID 5 or something like that. And I forget exactly exactly how it works, but I think it was something like you set the servo ID. Firstly, you need to t uh, have only that servo connected to the bus because you don't want to send this command to all of them. So just connect the one servo that you want to set the ID to. And then I think it's something like this. You set the ID to negative one and then the source will be, let's say, five like that. And then, well, you get rid of all these other ones. And <clears throat> then you upload the configuration like that and that would set the single servo that's connected to be ID5 something like that don't quote me on that it's been a while since I programmed it I'll have to go back and look at exactly how it works but suffice to say you you don't need to use that horrible user interface that the Luan Sol people made <laughs> well I'm not sure if this interface is a whole lot better but anyway you can use the IO mixer to assign the IDs as well okay let's see what we can do with some MIDI input and there are all kinds of MIDI controllers out there usually something to do with musical instruments but there are also more generic ones like this that just have some sliders and dials and buttons and so on and I found this one to be quite useful with IO mixer and it's connected to the IO mixer uh, your MIDI device need to have a hardware out um, not a USB only so that's what this wire is here and it's going to an, a UART on the IO mixer so again we could have um, three of these but I don't think you'd really need more than one and for my outputs I have a RGB LED strip and a servo and if we just have a look at this program over here um, I have a MIDI in node or a whole bunch of them and these four on the left are going to be detecting a note event and they have the index of the note that they are listening for and then they are each connected to an RGB LED output and there's no color set for these so they're just going to be white like that so that's these four pads 
here that I've set up there and it's a little bit bright to see maybe but they are doing a different LED each time and these pads have aftertouch and the IO mixer can um, listen for the aftertouch as well aftertouch just means that after you've played the note you you can remain holding the note and vary the the volume or the vibrato of it or whatever uh, you're controlling uh, so that's that and then we have three nodes here which are MIDI control events and the first one of these is my dial here and that's going to the servo output like that the next one is a toggle switch that's what these little buttons here are and this toggle switch is going to turn the seventh LED on to green like that just off and on toggle and then finally the one at the bottom there is a slider and that controls the red component of the eighth LED so just controlling it like that so you can set up all kinds of interesting things to control with this and keep in mind this could be radio controlling something as well with your custom radio NRF24 stuff set up right and this particular one has eight of each of those so we've got 24 in total so um, you could do some pretty cool stuff with this and 16 pads as well um, we do also have MIDI output capability and I'll just show you a node here um, I'm not going to demonstrate that in this video I think this video is getting a bit long but I will direct you to a link in the description to a video I made last year where I demonstrated this and we can create uh, MIDI note or control events so basically it's just the same as what we did there except it's going in the other direction so the IO mixer is going to be the originator of the event and it's going to be sending it to your computer or your other MIDI devices or whatever all right let's see how we can do some logging the IO mixer does not have any mass storage capability on itself but we can use one of these external SD card writers to do that so this connects over a UART connection and it uses one of these things that goes by the name of open log it's just a little Arduino basically and on the back it has an SD card that we can write to and as an example of writing some data I've just connected up um, well not connected but I've set up a pitch and roll sensor thing from the IMU so we've got those values showing up and I'm just going to record those and the way we do that is with a log output node so I'm going to set up a couple of these and essentially what these do is they write one set of values or well, each node writes a set of values to the SD card and we need to give them a column number so that's what this field is one there two there and the type of log that gets written will be set up in this features panel uh, the orange section here and just for the purposes of this demo I'm going to use CSV because that will give us something quick and easy to look at the binary one there is a much more efficient way to log things but you need a separate program to read that in and process it so I'm just going to use CSV which is text file for now and I'm going to log that at that board rate and 50 Hertz uh, update rate and when I oh wait where isn't this this should be powered up already why is it not going oh, wait let me just upload this and see oh there we go <laughs> sorry it was powered up but these LEDs are not power they are just to let you know that something's being written sorry I got a bit confused there so you can see see both those going and there's a little bit of flickering happening that means that there's some data being written right now uh, to make the data a little bit more interesting I'm just gonna go rolly rolly pitchy pitchy like that and then I will well I could turn it off or I could just do that and it has that data written to it so let me get this SD card out of here and I will show you what is on there so this is the contents of the file that was written just then uh, it's a text file but I opened it up in a spreadsheet so we can look at it in cells like this and at the beginning you can see the angles were close to zero while I was talking about it but if we select these columns and make a graph from them uh, line graph like that we'll see uh, so most of the time it was just sitting still and then around about the point 1000 or so let's start from 1000 we do a little bit of rolly rolly pitchy pitchy like that and um, yeah so you can take this data out and another thing you can do with these logs um, so that was CSV but if you use the binary output like that you can actually 
connect the UART output from this binary log to the input of another I.O. mixer and for that you would use a log input. So this, this one would be on the receiving I.O. mixer and then basically all of these values can be passed to another I.O. mixer up to I think 30 something, about 32 values you can pass every frame, 50 times a second that is, to another I.O. mixer and that could potentially be done over a serial modem so that you know could be wireless as well. Okay let's have a look at how we can use an I.O. mixer to emulate a USB gamepad device and we do that in this gamepad panel by setting the USB class to virtual com port and gamepad and then we need to restart the I.O. mixer and I've already done that so it's ready to go and on the configuration side we use these gamepad output nodes and output in this case means that the I.O. mixer is giving some output to the computer over the USB cable so I have a bunch of those and on the input side I'm using RC input or serial RC input from this receiver I'll just put that over there because for this little bit we want to look at my actual inputs which is coming from here and you see if I move my sticks here I have some movement over on the far left of the screen we can just test here to see that the axes are all moving as we expect and I've been using this to play X-Plane um, it's quite good for flight simulators because I can use this controller which I use to fly RC planes and it just feels very natural um, I'm not really super serious about flight sims but I know a lot of people are and this kind of system I think would be very useful to build your own sim pit I think they call them where you have all the controls set up as if you were sitting in an actual plane or um, racing car simulators people like to build those as well and so let me just uh, show you what's going on here I have ailerons elevator uh, rudder and on my throttle I'm using this to control the speed brake so when the throttle is all the way up the speed brakes are in and all the way down the speed brakes are fully extended and because this is a analog or a variable axis I can put them like halfway or three quarters or whatever as well um, so let's take off there we go and I didn't set up a binding for the brakes so I'm just going to push B on my keyboard to uh, get the brakes going Whoa. I mean, not not get the brakes going, get the brakes not going, I should say. Uh, I did set up a binding for the um, tow hook though, so we can do that. And I'll just let it go here. So you can see the tow hook on the plane in front of me. But I can let that go with my switch. And he goes on his merry way and I go on my merry way. And I think you get the idea, so I'll just uh, finish this up here. Okay, we're almost finished, and <laughs> there's just one more thing I wanted to show you, and that is the most recent addition to this system, which is the UART role of code. So we can select code there, and what that lets us do is connect to the I.O. mixer over a serial connection, and in this case I'm using a USB serial adapter, so this is just connected to my computer on that side. And into this side I'm going to type some commands. I'm just going to use the Arduino serial monitor uh, for this demonstration, but it could be anything that can send serial um, text over this connection like that and I also have a analog input in this potentiometer and a servo there and what we can do is we can read and write the values of any node that we like in the system so to start off I'm going to read the value of this analog input node and you see this little number in the brackets there that's the ID number there's a u unique ID for all these nodes and this one is ID 1 so to read the value of that we do G for get and then n for node and then the number of the node so it's a little bit like g-code but it's it's kind of not really g-code but anyway if I hit enter there we'll see that the current position of this potentiometer is 0 0.489 and if I turn it a little bit to the left it'll be a little bit less than that so get get node 1 Oops. Uh, now it's 0 0.36 so that's reading a node and we can also write a node uh, unfortunately I can't write directly to my servo PWM output node there but I can write to something that it reads from so I've just put this unary operator here it doesn't really matter what it is um, it's just a dummy node that I want to write to and this has the ID 2 so let's write to that and we do that by doing an S S for set node 2 and then a V for the value uh, the current value of this I think is 0 so if I set this to 1 and then enter here that servo will move over that way and just to demonstrate again, set node 2 value uh, 
five. All right, so hopefully that kind of makes sense. And the original motivation for setting up something like this was so that OpenPNP, the pick and place um, software, can interact with this system to maybe manipulate feeders or turn lights on or something like that. Um, because OpenPMV can send serial commands over a connection like this. So that's just another way you can interact with the IO mixer from some external system. Okay, that's going to do it for this video. As I suspected, it got kind of long, but I actually left a few things out, believe it or not. And it was a little bit dry, I think, because I was only showing you isolated pieces of the configuration rather than real-world use cases. But if you want to see some real-world use cases of this stuff, I will direct you to this playlist that I've been building up over the last um, couple of years where you can see some more in-depth um, you know, testing of these features. And if you have any questions, just let me know in the comments. Uh, and if you want to try one of these boards, I have a handful of them here at the moment. And I have been giving some away, but I don't think I can have really afford to do that anymore. But what I can do is just sell it to you at the price that it cost me to buy it myself. Uh, so let me know, um, iforce2d at gmail.com if you want to try that. And um, that's it. So thanks for watching.